Welcome to the Moments in History Bicentennial Walking Tour. This particular weekend is our final weekend, and it's also Bicentennial Homecoming Weekend in the capital city. So you'll see a lot of activity underway here on the St. Clair Mall, where we begin our tour. On this venture, I'm John J. Crittenden, Kentucky's 15th governor. We'll talk more about me later. The city of Frankfort, Kentucky, how did it get its name? Well, some believe that an incident that occurred when some settlers from Fayette County were traveling over to Jefferson County were encountered by Indians not too far from here on the Kentucky River. You see, in order to get from one place to another, you had to cross the Kentucky River. And consequently, Indians knew this as well. Well, these settlers were on a salt boiling expedition, and when they got down here a few blocks from us in Frankfort, Kentucky, while they crossed the river, the Indians ambushed them and shot a man named Stephen Frank. And from that time forward, it was referred to as Frank's Ford. I crossed the river at Frank's Ford and went on over to Lexington, Kentucky. That was sort of the way where Frankfort got its name. Now, 60 miles to the south of us is Stanford, Kentucky, and they were named because of a fort that withstood many Indian attacks. So consequently, their, their fort was called Standing Fort, and they got the name Stanford, and we're Frank Fort, but we got our name from a fort. So don't tell me how they got these towns confused. The area that we're on right now is the St. Clair Mall. This became a mall back in the 70s. At that time, it was a street like the rest of the community, but they decided to turn it into this beautiful mall that you see today. It was named for Arthur St. Clair. Arthur St. Clair was one of James Wilkinson's best friends and one of his cohorts during the American Revolutionary War. Wilkinson was the man who laid out the streets of Frankfurt and designed our town. We'll talk again more about him later. The buildings that you see on the St. Clair Mall are from the 1880s to 1890s, not near as old as many of the structures we'll be seeing on this tour. For instance, our theater off-Broadway building, that was the home of I. Davis's men's store for about 50 years. But a lot of people never seem to look at the upper edge of the architecture of these old buildings. You'll notice that it says Murray's Building at the top of the theater off-Broadway building now. And as we uh, take a look across the mall, to this other location above uh, JT's Food Mart, you'll see the name V. Kaltenbrunn. V. Kaltenbrunn was Victor Kaltenbrunn, a German immigrant who was a bootmaker and a shoemaker. And his son became one of Frankfurt's leading dentists in the early 1900s. And now behind us here is Selbert's Jewelry Store. Selbert's is one of our oldest, if not the oldest, continuous family-run store in Frankfurt, Kentucky. They originally, though, were across the mall where Smith Jewelers is located now. Smith Jewelers was the scene of Mary A. and Philip Selbert's jewelry store. And they, when Philip died, Mary A. decided that she wanted to uh, not be working in the same environment that her husband had worked in so many times, so she moved across the mall to the other location. Now, this building you see over here with all the windows, that is a former bookie joint. You can see how the sun would shine through those windows in the afternoon, and you can see the tote boards at the top there. The door at the bottom was the only entrance uh, into the facility, so that way they could also look from those windows down and make sure that the police weren't going to try to give them a raid. The street that is in front of us here is known today as Broadway, but in my time, 200 years ago, it was simply Market Street. For about two blocks to the right, there was a huge market on this street. And if you notice today, the farmers are still with us today and they're selling their wares and they're having uh, their market that they have every week during the summer selling their fresh vegetables. Well, back in the old days, they would be selling ax heads and settlers needs and things of this nature. The railroad track that runs through Frankfort, Kentucky is the second oldest railroad in the United States. It came along about 1830 and ended here in Frankfurt from Lexington to Frankfurt because of the Kentucky River. Here's some very distinguished looking guests coming our way right now. Abraham and Mary Todd Lincoln. Good morning, Mr. Crittenden. Yes. How are you? Glad to have you folks with us today. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. We would like uh, to say just a word about this magnificent building here behind us. It was built in the year 1827. The uh, author, or the architect rather, was Mr. Gideon Schrock. And uh, Mr. Schrock, I'd like for you to know, was only 24 years old at that time. Um, this building is uh, built out of local material. 
Um, you'll note that he has a contrast in color between the, the pillars and the facade behind it. Those pillars, by the way, are ionic columns, um, 33 feet tall and four feet in diameter. And because of that structure and the design, he is known as the father of Greek revival architecture. Now, Mary, of course, was in this building several times herself. That's right. You see, my father was a state representative and a state senator here in Kentucky. He was from Fayette County. We had a summer home here in Franklin County and came over many times when the streets were so very, very hot in Lexington. Of course, it was much cooler in the country. When my mother died, my father married a lady from Frankfurt, Betsy Humphreys. It was indeed a pleasure then to come over and visit with Grandmother Humphreys. My sister Emily was also married here in Franklin County. Franklin County was very important to us and was indeed an exciting place to be. Now, we uh, have an engagement this afternoon. Uh, Mary and I have tickets to the theater. We want to see this play, Our American Cousin, that we've been reading you so much about. Come with us. Uh, I, I, I don't think you really should go to the theater. Uh, oh, but the I, war is over. It's but, time to relax and enjoy life a little bit. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's been, been nice Thank knowing you, you Abraham Lincoln and Chris, Mary Todd. Good, good day. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. I guess we can't change history, can we, folks? How did Frankfort, Kentucky become the capital? There were many cities that wanted to be the capital of Kentucky. You had Lexington, you had Petersburg, Louisville. 200 years ago, we're celebrating, of course, our bicentennial this year. 200 years ago, Lexington was the largest city, Frankfurt was the second largest city, and Louisville was the fifth. There was even the community in Woodford County called Nunsuch that wanted to be the capital of Kentucky. Well, we got to be the capital the good old American way. We bought it. Uh, Alexander Holmes uh, got together some business folk in our community and gave the new legislature, which had no place to meet, no place to work out their new government constitution, we uh, had them offered $3,000 in cash. So consequently, that is basically how Frankfurt became the capital. We also gave them this beautiful square that you'll see amongst all the activity today for our bicentennial homecoming. Our government square was given to them uh, tax-free. On the right-hand corner was our, where our original uh, courthouse stood. It burned down. We had a school that was located over there, Kentucky Seminary. It too burned down. The monument that you see through the trees over there is a monument to Governor William Goebel. Governor Goebel was the only governor in the United States to die from an assassin's bullet. Uh, he was uh, killed in 1900 in January. And on that monument, you'll see some very lofty statements regarding his last words. In reality, Urban S. Cobb, a journalist from Louisville, the Courier Journal, who was working here in Frankfort, Kentucky and living in the old First Federal Building, which is the old Farmer's Bank Building on Main Street, Urban S. Cobb was talking with a doctor and he relates the story that the governor was lying there in his bed having just eaten his supper and he looked over to the doc and he says, Doc, there sure were pretty damn bad oysters and then he died. Now, whether or not that's the last uh, words or not of the governor, we feel like that on a monument of this particular scope, that might not be a very appropriate. Over on this corner of the old Capitol grounds was where our church, our first church, it was a community church, and it was built through a Kentucky lottery. They raised $4,000 to raise our first church. And then you have maybe the Baptist meeting at 8 o'clock and the the uh, Catholics at nine, that sort of thing. It was a shared community building. When the Methodists came to town, they decided, no, it's time for us all to have our own building. Shortly after that, uh, that building burned down as well. There's an interesting piece of architecture that you want to note here, ladies and gentlemen, and many people have not seen this in Frankfort, Kentucky. This is a unique face. He has, as you will see, a beard, a mustache. He has horns. And interesting enough, in talking with the owners of the building, the Gershmans here, Irv, he doesn't have any idea what this means or why it was there. There's only one like it in Frankfort, Kentucky. But if you'll notice the way the uh, creature is looking, he's looking directly over to the old state capitol where our government was centered. So perhaps he was a, a watchdog, so to speak, to make sure that uh, they didn't steal us blind which on a few occasions uh, some of the politicians did. One of our treasurers, Honest Dick, he wound up absconding with uh, several uh, million dollars of our treasury back in the old days. So perhaps that's what this creature is there for today as we see him looking over in our community. 
We're going to walk down Broadway here for a few moments, and we want to tell you about an interesting home that was the home of Solomon P. Sharp. Solomon P. Sharp was a lawyer who was from Virginia, but settled in western Kentucky, and he was around Bowling Green, Kentucky. If you'll notice just over the army trucks there, those three trees that have been hit by the Japanese beetle this summer and June, they were beautiful green, but they have uh, succumbed to that. That building on the other side of those three trees is the John C. Watts Federal Building. And it was on that area where Madison Street used to be that the home of Solomon P. Sharp was located. And he was an up and coming lawyer. President Madison said at the time he was uh, perhaps one of the greatest minds of the West. So he was indeed an elegant man who was a very handsome man and a great orator. And he was a lawyer in western Kentucky and he was destined for great things, perhaps becoming governor of Kentucky, perhaps uh, maybe even president of the United States, who knows? Because he met a woman which was his undoing. Her name was Ann Cook. And he uh, got into a, a liaison with Ann Cook. They had an illegitimate child. And he then was called by the governor to Frankfort, Kentucky to become our Attorney General. So he was happy to get out of that situation and come to Frankfort. Well, he settled not too far from where those three trees are, there on that green grassy knoll. And he married a woman of prominence here in our community, and he started raising a family. And of course, uh, he began to increase in stature politically. He became Speaker of the House. He defeated me, John J. Crittenden, for representative of the Franklin County at the legislature. So all this was happening. Meanwhile, while he was gaining in fame and stature in western Kentucky, Ann Cook was back there full of scorn and full of anger. And Ann Cook was getting very upset that he was getting all this attention while she was a forgotten woman. Another lawyer enters the picture, Jeroboam Beecham. He too becomes uh, enamored with Ann Cook. And so Jeroboam Beecham says, to make the story short, what would it take to get you to marry me? And she said, if you'll kill Solomon P. Sharp, I'll marry you. So in November of 1825, he came to that location and he, at two o'clock in the morning, stabbed Solomon P. Sharp and killed him. Well, after about a week or so, they determined who the killers were and both Ann Cook and Jeroboam Beecham were brought to Frankfort, Kentucky and lodged on the other side of the old state house in the jail. And they were gonna be hanged. But Ann Cook says, let's cheat the hangman. We'll kill ourselves, we'll commit suicide. So what she did, she said, we'll take poison. They took some laudanum. However, they must have been so honorary because the poison didn't take. So consequently, she said, well, well, we'll stab ourselves. So she indeed did that. She died from the stabbing wound, but uh, Jeroboam Beecham didn't. He lived long enough for the authorities to take him out on East Main to where the Glens Creek Road is, where the gallows were, and they hung him. So consequently, they were, they were killed, and they were buried together in the same uh, graveyard over in Bloomfield, Kentucky, buried together in the same coffin, arm in arm, and she wrote the epitaph. Now this street, this alley that we're on right now is Madison Street, and this is the very street that Solomon P. Sharp lived on. As you look back through that way and see where the little tree is on the other side of the truck and the telephone pole, right up there was Madison Street, and right to the left of that tree, about, a, about 50 feet or so, was where that house was located. This was known as the Kentucky Tragedy, and it was indeed such a notorious event that folks like Edgar Allan Poe based a story on it in one of his uh, collections of works. It's called Pollution. Robert Penn Warren wrote a book called World Enough in Time, which was quite a popular bestseller. So it's been quite uh, an exciting story here in Frankfort, Kentucky back in 1825. The containers you see here for BFI, the recycling bins, that's what we use today to take care of our recycling and our garbage. What did we do 200 years ago? Well, the folks simply took their garbage and trash, opened their windows and poured it out into the street. And the pigs would come along and eat it up. Now you might laugh at that, but if you stop to think what a wonderful way to recycle. You throw your garbage out into the street, the pigs come along, they gobble up the garbage, and then you later eat the pigs. So that is what we call true recycling. Over here to our left is the beautiful Church of the Ascension. Now we're seeing a rear shot of it right now, and eventually we'll see a frontal view of it as well. This church was built primarily by one man, John Harris Hanna, 
in the 1840s to 1850s. And he was the banker in our town. We certainly hope he used his own funds to build this church. The folks at the Church of the Ascension were very, very civic-minded as well as religious. They started one of the first programs for the poor, and they also started one of our first libraries here in Frankfort, Kentucky. As I say, we'll get an opportunity to see more of that building in just a moment. Frankfort, Kentucky, of course, uh, became a town about 1792, I think the records will say, and then, of course, uh, that's when we became a state as well. And we're having a wonderful time here in the capital city as well with our bicentennial walking tour. Coming up here on the corner is a parking lot. You perhaps remember the song, Pave Paradise, put up a parking lot. Uh, this is exactly what happened here because in this parking lot was once the home of Francis Preston Blair. Francis Preston Blair was a young man whose daddy was the Attorney General of Kentucky and he uh, lived over in Bell Point on the other side of the river and his son became a lawyer and became circuit clerk of the appeals and also worked on a newspaper with Amos Kendall. Amos Kendall was a famous newspaper man here in Frankfort, Kentucky and was a, quite a supporter of Andrew Jackson. And in his support, Andrew Jackson noted that, and when he became president of the United States, he asked Amos Kendall to come and be a part of his kitchen cabinet. So in Jackson's first term, Amos Kendall, who lived here in Frankfort, Kentucky, was one of the auditors with the Treasury Department, and then in the second term, he came, became the United States Postmaster General of the United States. But uh, Jackson, they, you know, they didn't have CNN or news conferences on television like we have today, press conferences. The only way the president could get the information out was through newspapers. And obviously, the president would like to have newspapers that were favorable to his views. So he wanted Amos to put together a paper for him, and, but Amos liked what he was doing. He said, I have a friend back in uh, Frankfort, Kentucky, that could handle this very well. His name is Francis Preston Blair. So consequently, they call Preston Blair to come to Washington, and he takes his family there, and they settle. Now, and he starts a newspaper called The Globe, and he was there for many years under many different presidents with his newspaper. Now, when you folks visit Washington, D.C., and you're at the White House, right across the street from the White House is the Blair House. And that Blair House there in Washington, D.C. was the same man who lived here on this corner, Francis Preston Blair. Now across this street that we're seeing here, this is Washington Street, named for President George Washington Street. The past alley we were in was uh, Madison Street, named for President Madison. This is Herod Brothers Funeral Home, but the building there next to Herod Brothers Funeral Home is the home of Landon Thomas. Landon Thomas was a lawyer here in Frankfort, Kentucky, and a representative to our uh, uh, state legislature over here. And he built this house that you see in 1840 on land that only cost $50. And that's Mr. Thomas across the street there. Mr. Thomas, have you got time to come over a moment and chat with us? We were hoping that uh, Mr. Thomas would have an opportunity to uh, uh, bring his sister with us today, but I understand your sister's not available. No, I'm sorry she's not because I, we had some very important people to meet. I, very proud of her, but she's upstairs still fixing her hair. You know, she's very concerned about her hair doing everything. What's so special about your sister? Her well, name, of course. Well, several things. Emily Tubman, uh, when the first Christian church burned, she gave $30,000, which was quite a f sum of money in those days, to help rebuild. She also was an uh, emancipationist and believed very much in helping the blacks and those who wanted to. She paid for 69 families, as a matter of fact, to go back to Africa. Now, this was a concept that was not prejudicial in nature right, at all. Right. It was designed to let the slaves return to their homeland. Many of them would remember their parents and their loved ones, their husbands and wives and brothers and sisters, and they wanted to go back. Right. And I understand yes. one family went back that wasn't too pleased That's being right. in Africa. That's right, and she, she paid for the way back to Frankfurt, as a matter of fact. They became so, so homesick. They right. They want to come back to what was home to them. Well, Mr. Landon Thomas, we appreciate uh, sharing a few moments well, with you. We're I know happy you're to be able to do that. Busy man, one of our lawyers right. in the community. Right. Thank you, and sir. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. Bye. Landon Thomas, whose sister Emily Tubman was quite a, a famous lady here in the capital city. She married a Georgia planter, and that was the source of her income that was enabling her to uh, award thirty thousand dollars there to the First Christian Church. Now you'll get an opportunity to see the Church of the Ascension here in all of its beauty, all of its glory. And the chapel next to it there, the Fellowship Hall, 
was built uh, much later than the original edifice here, which of course is uh, about 1840, 1850 in that time frame. We hesitate to put a specific number on some of these years because they get started one year and they're finished several years later oftentimes, and that's the way it works. Across the street, across Washington Street, is the home of Benjamin Cave Milam. Benjamin Cave Milam was quite a man in our community here in Frankfort, Kentucky. He saw what two brothers were doing, two jewelers on uh, Main Street in downtown Frankfort. They were coming up with a fishing reel. And people from Cincinnati and Chicago and surrounding areas were coming to Frankfort, Kentucky to buy this fishing reel. So he decided this was a good uh, program to become involved with, and he did. What he did was became partners with the Meek Brothers. It became the Meek Milam Fishing Reel. And eventually it wound up becoming just the Milam Fishing Reel as he would uh, go across to places like Paris, France and promote this fishing reel. He was at various world exhibitions from time to time and it became a very, very famous fishing reel. I understand that today you can go to Walmart as well and buy a fishing reel that has Milam on it. Over in South Frankfurt there is the Gale uh, family who had a fishing reel as well and Mr. Gale who had a little shop was doing some some special work for the federal government during the 1940s during World War II and uh, we found out that Japanese manufacturers liked these fishing reels so well that the men here in Frankfurt were making that they actually copied them and undercut and sold those fishing reels for a lesser price, which was not quite fair to those that were trying to make the dollars here at home. So this man in South Frankfurt, Mr. Gale, he was developing some projects for the federal government that he himself didn't know what they were going to be used for. It was top secret. And it turns out that what it was, he was developing bomb sites for the use of airplanes during World War II, which were used to bomb the Japanese over in the Pacific Theater. So you might say there was a little revenge taken there in the families there for the Japanese manufacturers taking their ideas. This house up here on the corner, this house is really a house that, uh, well, you might say it's a house within a house. What you're seeing right now was added on by Mr. Swigert, who is standing there on the porch, and we'll chat with him in just a moment. The original home, which we'll see in a moment, was the home of Dr. Preston Blair, John Brown, or rather, not Blair, but John... Dr. Preston Brown, who was John Brown of Liberty Hall's brother. But this particular man you're seeing here is Mr. Uh, Jacob Swigert. He and his brother Philip were quite entrepreneurs in our community, and it was men like uh, Mr. Swigert that put these uh, uh, many, many forces to work in our community. If you can, sir, would you come and visit with us a little bit today? Going back into time, ladies and gentlemen, to visit with a... Uh, businessman in our community who meant uh, a great deal and a great lot to making sure things would develop and work well in Frankfort, Kentucky. Mr. Swigert. Good morning. Good to see good you, morning. sir. Good to see you. Yes, sir. I was just telling the good folks about the many things that you've been involved with in terms of our community. Mm -hmm. Would you mind sharing some details about those uh, enterprises well, you were in surely. developing? Surely. Uh, well, my brother and I were involved in a number of things. Uh, of course, I'm an attorney and was uh, clerk to the Court of Appeals, the State Court of Appeals. And in addition to that, uh, I found a little time to start a few enterprises. We started the first uh, pork uh, rendering business here in Frankfurt, pork slaughtering. I uh, also started the first woolen mills here in Frankfurt. Uh, my brother and I were involved in the uh, Turnpike Authority, the first turnpike from here to Louisville, the first railroad. Um, the uh, in the May of Civic activities, we, uh, we got a number of things started, uh, including the uh, Frankfurt Cemetery, uh, the uh, First Methodist Church, and the first uh, public schools here, the first common schools here in, in Frankfurt. Tell us about the work you did in bringing water to the community. Well, that's right. That's right. Uh, Frankfurt did not have water at that time except from the river, and uh, people would have to go to springs we decided that we would pipe water from the springs over where the Montessori school is now and pipe that down here to Frankfurt by use of wooden logs. You hollowed out the logs and laid them end to end uh, and the water was brought right down here so that the people of the city of Frankfurt would have fresh water. You had a few losses during the Civil War, I understand. Yes, that was not one of my better investments. Uh, I did sell some of my woolen goods a considerable amount to the Confederacy 
and they paid me in their Confederate currency, which unfortunately after the war was worthless. So that was not a very good investment on my part. Well, I know we have a very busy weekend with our bicentennial homecoming, and you've got a lot of people to visit. We certainly appreciate your contributions to our community, Mr. Philip Swigert. Well, thank you. Thank you. Jacob Swigert. Philip thank was you. your brother, right? Yes, Philip was my brother. Yes, sir. Well, I've got to go to a board meeting now, so <laughs> if you'll excuse me. Thank you, sir. All right. This building that you see uh, to our right here, it was considered a gentleman's country townhouse. Now, it was built about 1800, 1810, somewhere in that area there. And it, the walls are two and a half feet thick. We have uh, an opportunity with two and a half feet thick walls to keep the heat in in the wintertime and the heat out in the summertime. And of course, uh, in 1967, this building was purchased by one of uh, Kentucky's foremost criminal attorneys, Mr. William Johnson. And he was telling us that downstairs in the basement area, which of course we really can't see from this vantage point, is uh, two huge kitchens. They have ovens down there. They're at least eight feet tall that would accommodate the folks that lived in this house. This was the home of General, or rather, Governor Charles S. Moorhead. Charles S. Moorhead was also a cousin to a previous governor before him, James T. Moorhead, and he had another cousin after him, uh, Simon Bolivar Buckner, that was a governor as well. So there was quite a bit of po political genes in that particular family. This is indeed a beautiful house, and it is uh, one that is housed for the Johnson and Judy Law Firm. Now we're approaching the area where they used to have a beautiful flower garden, but nowadays it's full of BMWs, Volvos, and Mercedes, as you can well see, and they're working diligently this weekend. But if you can, you can span the wall here and, and get a look and see how beautiful indeed these old houses and old structures are. And we do appreciate the various law firms in downtown Frankfurt that have uh, taken over these buildings for their facilities and offices because it does take a great deal of money to keep them up. And this is a beautiful uh, picture of what we can have in our community. This next house is the John Goodman House. No, it's not for you Roseanne Barr television viewers, uh, the home of one of the TV personalities, but this is a John Goodman who was a musician and a music teacher here in the early 1800s in Frankfort, Kentucky. He also was a man who built musical instruments. He built a piano for Governor Garrett's daughter, which still is in use down at Liberty Hall here in Frankfort, Kentucky. The building next door is the home of uh, Chapman Coleman Todd. Chapman Coleman Todd is one of Frankfurt's three admirals that was born and lived here in Frankfurt, Kentucky. He was among the uh, first white people to explore the Orinoco and Amazon rivers down in South America. You note the beautiful fan window there. A lot of people don't see this when they walk by because they kind of walk by hurriedly and it's a recessed area. It is indeed a beautiful fan window. Right behind us here is another nice fan window that you'll see in the attic of the building of home of Charles S. Moorhead that we just mentioned a while ago. We are now approaching what they call the corner of celebrities in Frankfort, Kentucky. And over here is my home. I told you my name was John J. Crittenden. I was born in Woodford County over in uh, just outside of Versailles in a log cabin. By the way, that log cabin is still standing. If you so desire, you can see that log cabin. It's on the old Methodist rest home property. This building that you're looking at, my home, was built in 1800. And I came to live here about 1819. I had been a lawyer down in Russellville, Kentucky, Logan County. And as a uh, legislator from that area to Frankfurt, I fell in love with this town. And I indeed was so happy to make this my home. Now, as you can see, this is quite an edifice here. Not all of the building was a part of it when I lived here, but for the most part it was. And I was on various occasions married to three different women. So we had a lot of children from previous marriages that they brought into our family. So we needed a, a large place to, uh, to dwell and to live. In fact, uh, some of my children were quite famous. During the Civil War, I had two sons, one of which was a general for the Civil War uh, for the northern side, and the other son was a general for the southern side. We also had a grandson, John J. Crittenden III, 
who was uh, killed with George Armstrong Custer at the Battle of Little Bighorn out in Montana. I was your 15th governor. I was a United States Senator under many presidents. I was also United States Attorney General on several occasions. I even acted as Secretary of State for a couple of years. This block that you see behind me here is a carriage block. And this is from one of the old capitals that President Lincoln was telling you about. Uh, I always have our visitors stand on this block and many of them have their pictures made because I would come out of my carriage Remember the streets of those days, and by the way, as we know this, this is Main Street, but in my time it was Montgomery Street, named for one of the generals during the Revolutionary War. But they were very dirty, and I would get out of my carriage and stand on this block. And among many of those who have stood on this old edifice from the old, one of the burned down old capitals, we've had uh, Zachary Taylor stand here, Aaron Burr has stood here, We've also had Daniel Webster, the famous Secretary of State. He visited here and stood on this. Henry Clay was, of course, a visitor in Frankfort, Kentucky. President Monroe, President Madison, and uh, quite a few famous people have been here, including Zachary Taylor. Zachary Taylor, on the way to Washington, D.C., to be inaugurated President of the United States, stopped by here and visited with me, and he asked me to become his Secretary of State. And I turned him down. And my main reason for that was I didn't want the rest of the, the United States to think that perhaps there was some collusion on my part, that uh, there was some underhanded politics going on that would give me such a, a high stature's place. Because back in those days, whoever became Secretary of State almost automatically became President of the United States. And earlier, Henry Clay had done the same thing. He took the opportunity to be the Secretary of State under John Quincy Adams. And Henry Clay, as we all know, never did become president, and it was because many people felt there was collusion on his part. I would say that uh, John J. Crittenden perhaps is one of the most highest morally minded men that we've ever had that came out of Kentucky as a statesman. He also wrote the Crittenden Compromise, and the Crittenden Compromise was designed to prevent the Civil War, which took so many lives. Unfortunately, at the time, President Lincoln was more interested in preserving the Republican Party than he was <laughs> The, the Union. It was uh, during the Civil War that we began to see the greatness of Abraham Lincoln. This building across the street, this is the home of Dr. Preston Blair that we were telling you about. And we'll move over here a little bit to perhaps give you a view of some of the base area. You can see the stones, and that was the original edifice there. Unfortunately, you're not going to see the doorway as well as you could because of that van, but that's uh, 1992 for you. And it was uh, a house within a house. This was the original opening for the house and the original front door. But when Mr. Swigert bought the house, he added that which is to the right there on the end. And he added all this behind it to the left as well. And that was the home originally of Dr. Preston Brown. As we continue to walk down what we knew then as Main Street, actually it was Montgomery Street, we approached uh, several older buildings. This building here, that's the gray one on your left, this was the home of the judge, Hazelrig, who uh, very quickly went down when Goebel was shot and swore him into office as the governor. This was his home. Up here on the corner, you see a, another lawyer firm right now, but in its old day, that was the home of the Pepper family. And the Pepper family were quite uh, involved in the uh, distillery business, but they also, were very cultural minded people and they would invite many people to come to their house to um, partake of food uh, free and they would also have, be in a position to enjoy uh, lodging if they liked for as long as they would. Across the street here is the beautiful First Presbyterian Church and it was uh, built about 1848 or so and these uh, folks were among the very first to organize their church here in Frankfort, Kentucky, about 815, when the Presbyterians began to organize. Their original church building was located over on Wapping Street, where the Catholic Church is. They uh, sold that building to the Catholics, and they built this building for about, oh, 14 to $15,000 or so back then. And it was kind of unique. The same time they uh, finished their building was about the same time when Zachary Taylor was visiting me at my house. So they invited the president to be and his wife and me and my wife to come down and they were located right over there where the monument marker is 
and they put up some big risers and we sat up in big chairs there and welcomed the people as they came to visit the church. As we continue strolling down Main Street today, but Montgomery Street back then, we're now getting ready to approach a uh, beautiful house here on the corner, another home of a distiller that lived here. And you'll notice how beautiful this is uh, kept and uh, just, it's just lovely to see. This is the Stites and Harbison Law Firm now today, another group of lawyers who have maintained our structures and kept our buildings looking so beautiful for not only themselves, but any visitors that might come to our little community of Frankfurt. Over on the corner there, that was the home of one of my sons. That was the Union General during the Civil War. And the white building next door to it has a bit of history involved as well. This uh, building you're looking at, the little white building, was one time the home of Ann Armstrong Thompson, a local mystery writer from Lexington, Kentucky, had several bestseller thrilling books back in the 70s. Well, she was doing some renovation work in her house and found where a cannonball had been lodged in the front wall of her home. And she did some research and found out that it was a federal cannonball, that it was from one of the Union cannons. And it's possible, maybe, that they were trying to shoot the general at his house and missed. We'll never know. But uh, my son lived in this house on the corner. And the house is very unique in itself, that there's only three other houses like it. Underneath that clapboard, you'll find a series of bricks and logs that build that structure up. And of course, we can't see it, but it is indeed a beautiful uh, building. This was one that was preserved. There was a time when they were going to tear it down, but it was saved back in the 70s, and we still have it today to share with many other folks. Now let's approach Frankfurt's oldest home, 1796, and that's the home of Senator John Brown, Liberty Hall. Liberty Hall, of course, is uh, the home of John Brown, and he is with us today. I see him up on the steps. He built this house originally for his parents. His daddy was a preacher, but before he could ever bring them here to live, he got married to Margaretta Brown, and <laughs> consequently, uh, he brought his wife instead. His wife, Margaretta, was a very, very religious lady. Senator Brown, how are you, sir? Where is uh, your wife today? I'm so sorry. She will be sorry she missed you, but she's at her Saturday morning missionary society. I really think she spends more time at the church than she spends at home. There's no doubt she's more religious than I am. I think my best chance of heaven will be to cling to her skirts. Margaretta Brown is one of the ladies, along with Mrs. Elizabeth Love, who built uh, or started the first Sunday school uh, west of the Allegheny Mountains. It was a Sunday school for young ladies. And many of those girls would learn uh, various Bible verses, and indeed some of them learned uh, many chapters and indeed even books of the Bible. Some learned the entire book of Isaiah. So she was quite a, a prominent lady. And it was in the gardens here, I understand, where the Sunday school actually took place. Now, you had quite a few distinguished visitors along the way. Uh, you all were very hospitable, were you not? Oh, yes. Margaret and I both loved to entertain. Though we have five children, and my brother, James, lived with us when he was not in Washington or Europe, we still had room for guests at any time. I particularly remember a memorable breakfast when we had Senator Monroe, a go uh, President Monroe, and uh, Zachary Taylor and Andrew Jackson here all at the same time, all men that were President of the United States. We also entertained the Marquis de Lafayette though I really have to admit that he came to see my wife and not to see me. Now, before you misunderstand what he meant by that, uh, his wife's father was Lafayette's chaplain during the Revolutionary War. So it was quite fitting that she would want to see Lafayette and hear some stories about her daddy. Well, as it was, they had a grand ball a few blocks from here at the old Capitol Hotel, which is now the State National Bank building. When they had the ball, she wouldn't go because of her religious uh, feelings. She didn't want to be near drink or dancing, and consequently she stayed home. It was kind of grieving that she didn't get to meet with the Marquis de Lafayette. So he sneaked out of the ball and came down here to Liberty Hall and spent some time with her as well. I understand the uh, bricks were made right here on the land and that uh, much of the, uh, the windows are the real windows. Oh, yes. Uh, we made all the bricks down on the river, and the wood in the house is it's, uh, came off this land. Of course, the glaze we had to bring over the mountains and down the river. So long after the house was finished, we didn't have windows in our house or glass. 
<laughs> now your brother James Brown, of course, was the minister to France under President Monroe, and it was his brother James Brown that uh, gave the Monroe Doctrine to the French government. And he at one time lived here off and on with his brother John. Well, we certainly appreciate the time that you spent with us today, sir. Thank you, Governor. Yes, sir. Others who visited in the beautiful Liberty Hall have included uh, President Teddy Roosevelt and President Madison. The trees that you see here, these are over 200 years old. They're catawpa trees, and they were here before the house was built. So it is a rather unique thing to have with us. I must say a few things about John Brown that we didn't to share in front of him. I didn't want to embarrass him. You've heard of the conspiracy, Aaron Burr and James Wilkinson. Well, John Brown was a part of that conspiracy as well. This was an idea that the Kentuckians had born out of necessity. You see, when we became a state 200 years ago, we did not get the representation from the federal government that we felt we should. When we were fighting Indians, and by the way, just 200 years ago this year, we were fighting Indians in Peaks Mill at Cook's Cabin. So we didn't have any help very much from the federal government. So why should we be a part of an organization that wasn't assisting us? It was the settlers that had to fight the Indians. It was too expensive a project to send help from over the mountains. And when it came to selling our goods, that was another problem that we had. So consequently, uh, by not having opportunity to sell our goods, it was so expensive to send them over the mountains to the East Coast, why not put them on the Kentucky River, float them down to the Ohio, down to the Mississippi, and down to New Orleans, where we could sell our goods five times as much to the Spanish. But we had a problem with the Spanish. Wait a minute, look what I see. The Gray Lady. Ladies and gentlemen, we've heard a lot about the Gray Lady. She was a woman who was Margretta Brown's aunt, and she lived in New York. And it is said that she haunts the halls of Liberty Hall. You see, what happened was Margretta had a baby that died. And consequently, when her uh, aunt heard about it in New York, Margretta came to Frankfort, Kentucky to visit her, and she rode for three days and three nights on horseback. And by the time she got here, she was so exhausted that she died. The caretaker in the building says that he has seen pages turned by themselves, rocking chairs rocked by themselves, doors closed by themselves, and hear strange creaking footsteps in the upper rooms. Now whether all that's true or not, I don't know, but we've just seen the gray lady. When they had a fire in Liberty Hall in the early 1960s, they had a problem there with some smoke damage, so they repainted much of the area there. And at the top of the steps, uh, she stood, uh, and they have a picture of her standing there with her hands folded looking down the stairs. And it's a woman you can very distinctly see, the gray lady. And as we've seen, the gray lady is still with us. Well, maybe we didn't see that. Maybe it won't show up, up on tape. I'm not sure how the video will bring that about. But anyway, getting back to our story, whew, Pardon me, folks. I'm just a little bit befuddled there. I never dreamed that. Well, anyway, that's another story. Our uh, friend, Mr. Brown, was a part of this concept. We, we were unable to develop trade agreements with Spain because we were not working together as countries. So consequently, if you did business with the Spanish, you were doing a traitorous act. So consequently, John Brown and many other Kentuckians, such as Aaron Burr, the former vice president, uh, they, they, they wanted to do this. They wanted to create a Kentucky country. And James Wilkinson, for whom this street, Wilkinson Boulevard, Wilkinson Street, is named for, he wanted to be king of Kentucky. But, of course, that uh, never came to be because uh, we found out all about the plotting that was going on, and much of that stuff happened right here in Frankfort, Kentucky. Over here on this corner, you'll see a new modern development here. At one time, that was one of the biggest houses in Frankfort, Kentucky. It was located on this corner. It, the man that owned the house was a riverboat captain, and he was a very tall man. He was always banging his elbow on the boat or hitting his head on the deck of the boat and so forth because he was so large. So he said that, well, I want to build me a house that will be the biggest structure to accommodate my frame, and he did, and it was on this corner here. Unfortunately, through the years, it... Uh, went uh, down and eventually was burnt. I think arson was involved in that effort, and it was too expensive a project to replace. This house is the Orlando Brown House, built by Gideon Schrock, the same man who built our old capital. 
This is said to be the only residence that he ever built. He primarily built uh, state buildings such as our Franklin County Courthouse or the Jefferson County Courthouse or the uh, old Morrison's Hall at Transylvania. In fact, uh, Gideon Schrock is getting a bit of uh, prominence today through the presidential race. Uh, Governor Bill Clinton of Little Rock, Arkansas is of course running for President of the United States and when you see him at Little Rock in his state building behind him, that building was built by Kentucky's own Gideon Schrock. Gideon was only 24 years old when he built our old state capital here in Frankfort, Kentucky. He was a remarkable man. This home of Orlando Brown, he was a newspaper man. He also was with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and uh, he had a son, Orlando Brown Jr., who was also in the Civil War. James Wilkinson was an interesting man. He had been in the Revolutionary War, worked right there with George Washington and Lafayette and many of the others. Quite a famous man, a very young man to have exceeded as well. When he came to Frankfort, Kentucky, this was a boggy, marshy area. It was an area full of mosquitoes and quicksand. And he and his uh, fellow soldiers from the Revolutionary War days, they cleaned up the area and they laid the streets of Frankfort. We only had about one house. It was located on this corner here where Rose and Bob Polsgrove live today. It was not this house, ladies and gentlemen, because this house was built many years afterwards. It was a two-story log cabin that James built. And while he and his wife were living in Lexington, he built this frame. And he said, I want to bring my wife, Ann, for whom Ann Street is named, to come here and live. So he brought her over, and when she saw this house and its location and the empty streets in the area here, she said, well, I'm not going to live in this one house town. I'm going back to Lexington. If you want to, you can stay. So he eventually sold it to Alexander Holmes, who the man we mentioned earlier that helped uh, procure the state uh, capital for, for, for Kentucky here in Frankfort. Uh, Mr. Holmes owned this residence for a time, and it was our first uh, site of the legislature. This is where they met. This is where your first sermon was preached, right on this very corner in Frankfort, Kentucky. This is the uh, location of the uh, double log house where the legislature met for many years until they got the old Capitol building built. Well, we have another story here. When Holmes finally was finished with using the building, he leased it to uh, Thomas Love and his wife Elizabeth, and they turned it into the Love Tavern. Now, uh, we generally think of a tavern as one of the places to do this, but in those days, 200 years ago, a tavern was a nice facility to stay overnight. The roads were not uh, as well as they are today. We had a lot of muddy, rocky, full of holes, and, and uh, it would take a good deal of time to travel. So you needed a lot of inns and houses along the way to stay the night. Well, on this location, in this old log house, we had people like Andrew Jackson spend the night, uh, Zachary Taylor spent the night there. Uh, we had the King of France. He was in exile. Uh, Philippe, he came to visit with us, and it is said that while he was here, they had a big ball. Anytime the Kentuckians could have an opportunity to have a dance or a, a party time, they were always wanting to do that. And they had this big ball and dance in the house for the King of France. And he asked Mrs. Love if she would dance with him, and she turned him down. Well, her neighbor said, Lizzie, how could you do that? Uh, you're, you, you turned down the King of France. That's embarrassing to us. What will he think of us? She says, well, my neighbor down the street, his son had asked me to dance, and I had turned him down. And I felt like I would have to turn down anyone else, including the King of France, for that very reason. She was a very gracious lady, and she was the first woman to be buried in the Frankfurt Cemetery. All that happened long ago on this corner. On this corner is where Aaron Burr stayed and lived. And remember, he was the man who had uh, shot Alexander Hamilton in a duel. He had been Vice President of the United States. He came to Frankfurt, and he stayed on this corner for quite some time in order to uh, plan his situation to create a new country and he was first indicted here in Frankfort, Kentucky and uh, I might say too that uh, he got his lawyer to be uh, Henry Clay who got him off and it was first here in Frankfort that uh, this happened. Let's cross the street now and come up into the 1900s. This house that you see that stretches from the corner all the way down to that big huge tree this house was called Garden Hall and was built by Graham Vreeling, who was the editor at that time of the Frankfurt State Journal. In more recent times, this has been the home of Governor, or rather, Judge Henry Miggs. 
His uh, wife was the daughter of a governor, Ms. Willis. And so consequently, uh, this was their home, a beautiful residence. This tree that we're approaching right here is a Jinko tree. It's a native to China or Japan. And in just a few weeks, these leaves will begin to turn yellow. Their texture right now is sort of slick, but when they begin to turn yellow and finally fall, they feel like velvet and they're well worth keeping. The interesting to note about the Jinko tree, they're all over Frankfort, Kentucky. Somebody must have come through here about 80 years ago and planted these trees. This is a male tree. The female tree has a peculiar odor that is very offensive, and thank goodness, to my knowledge, he didn't plant any female trees in Frankfurt. The oddity about this tree is that within a space of two to five hours, all of these leaves will drop at the same time. It almost looks like a yellow blizzard, a yellow snowstorm, and it is a rarity. I've lived here for 27 years. I've only seen it happen one time. So consequently, uh, I wanted to get my wife Karen to see it, but I didn't want to leave uh, for fear I would miss it all myself, so she didn't get to see it. But they are a hazard. For instance, there's one at the intersection of 4th Street and Capitol Avenue in Frankfurt that when the leaves all fall, I mean, they'll leave a pile about this deep. So consequently, it's very difficult for motorists because when you try to stop, you slide in those leaves. And you try to start, you fishtail. And there's been a few accidents along the way caused by these lovely old trees. And they're everywhere in Frankfort, Kentucky. Our next building that we're concerned with is down the street here where the wrought iron is uh, sticking out. This is the beautiful Gray Gables. And this was built by John. Now, John was not famous in his lifetime. His brother George was. And consequently, <laughs> We know nothing about George today. When he was alive, George was the United States Treasurer under President John Tyler. But uh, this house here was the home of John Bibb, who developed Bibb Lettuce. And Bibb Lettuce, of course, is quite famous to all of us who enjoy uh, a, a fine salad. So today we know about John Bibb, and nobody remembers George Mortimer Bibb, his brother. This home is now the home of Little Bill Johnson, another lawyer in our community. His grandfather wrote the history of Franklin County. He wrote the uh, history of the Frankfurt Cemetery. And he also wrote uh, Kentucky Trials and Tragedies, another very fascinating book. Now, this young man sitting down here reading is not John Bibb, ladies and gentlemen. This also was the home of Patty Burnley. And she was a niece of John Bibb. And she would often have many uh, cultural evenings. They started the Chautauqua here. And this young man is Robert Burns Wilson, who visited here many years ago. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Tell us your claim to fame. My claim to fame is I was born in uh, 1850 in Pennsylvania, and 25 years later came to live here in Kentucky and find a place for myself as a painter and as a poet. Uh, many of my early years here in Frankfurt were spent painting mainly the landscape around Elkhorn Creek and the Kentucky River. Uh, and as a matter of fact, you can still find uh, some of my work hanging in the houses and homes around uh, this area here. Um, did do some writing as well. Uh, wrote mainly poems, but I also wrote a novel called Until the Daybreak, uh, which was a murder mystery uh, that I wrote in 1900 set mainly down here in the Best Lindsay House on the corner of uh, Wapping and Washington here. Of course, uh, my painting and my novels uh, probably is not why you're here today, but rather my poetry is uh, where I really found a place for myself. Uh, and one poem in particular uh, that I wrote in 1898 uh, would become my claim to fame, so to speak. Um, you've got to understand 1898 was a turbulent time in American history. Uh, the battleship, the USS Maine, had just been sunk in Havana Harbor by a Spanish mine. And uh, many Americans, as myself, were outraged by that action, uh, having already grown somewhat suspicious of the Spaniards to begin with. So in late, later in 1898, I uh, sat down and tried to put my feelings on paper. And what I came up with was a poem called Remember the Main, which the New York Herald published later that year in its entirety. And the American Congress, uh, some days later, uh, adopted Remember the Main as the U.S. 
battle song of the Spanish-American War. Now, with many things in life, uh, uh, that moved very quickly for me. And uh, since that was my claim to fame, uh, I'd like to share a little bit of it with you right now. And uh, you'll probably remember some of it, some of you. When the vengeance wakes, when the battle breaks, and the ships sweep out to sea, when the foe is neared, when the decks are cleared, and the colors floating free, when the squadrons meet, when it's fleet to fleet, and front to front with Spain, from ship to ship, from lip to lip, pass on the quick refrain. Remember, remember the main. Now, as with many young men at the time, once I had had my first taste of success, I was eager for more. And uh, around the turn of the century, uh, with my wife, we moved to uh, New York to find greater fame and success. Now, in all fairness at this point, I should tell you my success was somewhat limited. I always wanted to come back to Kentucky, and uh, really my poems and other writings never quite caught on the way I hoped they would. And in 1916, upon my death here uh, in New York, uh, if I'd known then what I know now, I probably would have been a much happier gentleman indeed, because you see, in 1916, I was interred here in Frankfurt, uh, up on the hill in Frankfurt Cemetery, among the likes of uh, Daniel Boone and uh, many of Kentucky's former governors. But that's enough about me. I uh, understand that you've got many more places to go and uh, quite a few more people to see. So uh, I thank you for stopping by. We're looking at a unique way of showing Watson Court, a little alley here in Frankfurt off Wapping Street. Uh, this is also uh, immortalized in one of the paintings of Paul Sawyer, who we'll talk about in just a moment. The house on the other side is the Thomas Carneal House. Thomas Carneal was one of the co-founders of Louisville, Kentucky. He was a tax man, and he lived here in Frankfurt for a time. This house is on the National Registry of Historic Places. And any time that you do any work on one of these buildings, these structures, you have to replace them in the manner with which they were original. They did some work on the gutters not so long ago, and it cost uh, several thousand dollars, upwards to about $15,000 to get that uh, gutter work taken care of because it's copper, I understand. Right now, today, this house is the home of the state YMCA the Kentucky Youth Association, who recently sent some uh, uh, trucks down to Louisiana to help out the victims of Hurricane Andrew. They've been quite busy there. And by the way, you're invited during the week to come and visit this uh, building. They would love to have you. Across the street is the home of one of our admirals that lived in the corner of celebrities. Hugh Rodman lived in this house. Hugh was a very fortunate man that he served in the Navy during the time when we had uh, sails and wooden vessels and on into the 1900s when we had the steamships. So he got to really see the changing of the world as far as the naval vessels were concerned. He was commander of the Pacific Fleet during World War I and his wife was very fortunate to go with him many, many times traveling all over the world. He helped build the Panama Canal. He was on duty down there. This beautiful memorial garden, flower garden, was built in the memory of Ida Lee Willis. And Ida Lee Willis was a lady who uh, was concerned that a business firm was going to come into Frankfort, Kentucky and destroy this building on the corner here. And so she went to Governor Ned Breathitt and said, uh, Governor, you can't let this happen anymore. You've got to do something to stop it or they're going to tear down all of our beautiful buildings. So consequently, the governor recognized what she said was a truth. So he saved the structure from being destroyed. And he also permitted the building to come to town. And that's it that we know today as the Bush Building. It's the house of our Justice Cabinet now and also our Kentucky Bicentennial Commission, which, by the way, afforded Pegasus players a grant in order for us to have the walking tour this summer. Now, why is this structure here so important to Ida Lee Willis? Well, not only because of its age and everything, it's been here for quite some time, but one of the people that lived here actually was born across the river next to the Singing Bridge where the old YMCA is located. Uh, the man that lived here was uh, Graham Vest. and He became a senator and quite famous in Missouri. 
But uh, the man that lived in this house has left us something that all of us quite remember. And if you remember the little phrase, a dog is man's best friend, he came up with that in one of his uh, trials that he was having where a little dog was killed and he talked about the loyalty of the animal to the master and he used that phrase in his summation to the jury that dog is man's best friend. So that happened right here in this little house here in terms of the man who built it. The stump that you see there on the ground it used to be a beautiful tree earlier this uh, spring. We had one of our cataclysmic storms not so long ago, and it was completely uh, uh, bent out of shape, uh, cracked by lightning. And, but to show you the longevity of these old houses, instead of it falling against the house and doing the structure damage, it fell between this tree, the marker, and the house, and only a little bit of damage was done to the tree standing there. You can see some of the limbs that were broken. And there are a few leaves on the shutters, you'll see, from where it hung over here on the house. If you notice the little tines, the spikes that are on those shutters at the top, they're designed to keep the birds from doing their business. Well, it did do a little damage to the gutter at the top, but they've already repaired that. So these old houses have a unique way of staying with us as long as man doesn't get into the act. Across the street, is the home of Robert Perkins Letcher. And he was one of our governors. And when he became elected governor to Kentucky, Congress was very upset. He'd been a congressman there. And the reason they were upset was because he was such a humorous man. He had a unique ability to take any uh, serious situation and defuse it by uh, making something uh, light out of it, but not yet a derogatory thing. And they really missed him because in many times uh, in government work, you needed something to diffuse some of the tension that would build up. Robert Perkins Letcher was also the governor during the time when we incorporated the Frankfurt Cemetery. Our Frankfurt Cemetery is the second incorporated cemetery in the United States, Boston being the first. And he, along with men like uh, Mr. Swigert that we met earlier today, thought it would be wonderful to have a cemetery that uh, entombed many famous people. So they went about getting Daniel Boone to be buried here. They made arrangements with the family to reinter him from Missouri and bring him to Frankfort, Kentucky. Well, we're not sure that we actually have Daniel Boone up there. Uh, you see, back in those days, in Kentucky, we bury side by side, but in Missouri, they buried end to end. So when they went to get uh, Daniel Boone's wife, they got her, but they took the person uh, next to her, which might have been a slave. Well, I'm sure we'll never really know, but that's just another one of the interesting stories you encounter in history. Across the street is the Justice Thomas Todd House. Thomas Todd was a young fellow who lied about his age so he could be in the Revolutionary War. He was only 14 years old, and he met some men from Frankfurt and decided to come here and make his home, and he became a lawyer and went to Washington, D.C., and became one of our Supreme Court judges and was there until he died. And while he was in Washington, D.C., he met a beautiful little girl who just happened to be the sister of Dolly Madison, who was married to the President of the United States, James Madison. And so they, when they got married, were the first wedding to ever take place in the White House. So we had a guy from Frankfurt to be married in the White House or rather, uh, for the first time, the first marriage that ever occurred. That building now, of course, is part of the First United Methodist Church who've renovated it. You see all these cars in the parking lot today. That's because of the Crime Stoppers uh, annual uh, classic bass contest that they have. And it's going on this weekend as we're making our tape. But there in this spot used to be a beautiful place called the Terraces. And it was one of the homes that was destroyed for whatever reason. And that was one of the reasons Ms. Willis wanted to go ahead and, and start saving our old homes here in Frankfurt rather than let them all be torn down. This big, huge building behind us here is the uh, federal building built about 1888. It was where the post office was, and they must have known something because this building is the only post office in the United States that never had the name U.S. Post Office written in front of it. And, of course, we moved our post office some time later, and this then became the Paul Sawyer um, Library. Paul Sawyer, of course, is one of our famous painters. Uh, Paul was born in Madison County, Ohio, but he spent many years here in Frankfort, Kentucky. He and his family went to the First Baptist Church, which is down here at the corner, and he never married. He lived to be 52 years old, 
and he died of a heart attack and left some 4,000 paintings and he was involved with several women but he would said he'd rather paint than party because he knew and recognized the responsibility of marriage. So and one of the ways he found that out was when his daddy became senile, he had to take care of his family. So the folks at the First Baptist Church, they said, uh, you can go ahead and, and live in the rear of our building. We have a building out back there you can stay in. And so they stayed there and his mom, she made pastries and he did paintings and that's how they provided for their family. Across the street is the Catholic Church. Now this Catholic Church was originally not here, it was the Presbyterian Church. Presbyterians sold their building to the Catholics and the Catholics instead of tearing down the building that was there that the Presbyterians had, they built this building around and over top so that uh, leaving the front open they could still worship each uh, Lord's Day there in the church that was inside their building. And this was built by a man who wanted the help of many of the congregation to actually do the work. So many of the folks in the Catholic Church actually laid the bricks there and put it all together. As we continue walking along, we have on this corner here where Kroll Insurance is, that was one of Frankfurt's first saloons. And of course the river is to our right, and our famous singing bridge is right here. And consequently, uh, when you would have people come off the river, they would probably hit this saloon first of all and after they'd spent a little time in the saloon maybe they'd go over to one of our churches on these corners here and do a little repenting we'll never know as we look at this street here all the way down st Clair street i've often referred to this as blah street we've seen a lot of beautiful architecture we've been on the mall and we've seen what paint can do and here we see a, a street that's not as glamorous uh, creatively from an architectural standpoint or as beautiful from a painting standpoint. For instance, the executive building here on St. Clair, this big building 25 years ago was our Sears store. And you notice that all the windows now are boarded up, they're bricked over, and because usually the state winds up taking any empty buildings and making it a state office, and I guess maybe to keep the uh, state employees busy and not looking out the windows, they wanted to board those up. You notice at the very top, you can see some lion's heads in this uh, architecture of this building. They are akin, perhaps, to that creature we saw earlier on our trip, but in no way are they uh, related. One of the early preachers that came to Frankfort, Kentucky, he got the call from the Lord, having heard Barton W. Stone and also Alexander Campbell to create a new church. So he went to the Baptists and asked them if he could use their facility to uh, present a new church concept and religion where the Bible speaks we speak and where the Bible is silent we're silent and they said no I don't think we better do that and he tried to at various other churches in town to use their facility but they wouldn't let him so he didn't really know what to do so he said Lord you've called me to do this but I really don't uh, know what I'm going to do so what he wound up doing he got this idea he would go ahead and and put out some signs about a such and such a time, such and such a day, that we meet right here on the steps of the Franklin County Courthouse. And this is where he preached his sermon, and this is where he began what became the first Christian church in Frankfort, Kentucky. Franklin County Courthouse was built about 1835 by Gideon Schrock, who we've talked about before, and it was built for something like $12,000. They paid it off in about five years. Uh, I don't know if we have any preacher's kids in our audience today. Since we've been talking about the church and the first Christian church, uh, everybody knows that preacher's kids have a lot more pressure on them due to the fact that they're at the church all the time and they have to behave and conduct themselves in such a manner as uh, their parents would have them. Well, we have in Frankfort, Kentucky, one of the most famous preacher's kids that sort of got out of hand. His name was Albert Bacon Fall, and his daddy was Philip Fall, who preached the first Christian church here in Frankfort, Kentucky. Albert Bacon was born here and then went on to uh, other places to live. In fact, if you remember in your history lessons, the Teapot Dome scandal, well, the man, the United States Ministry of the Interior that was indicted and, and eventually uh, jailed, incarcerated, was Albert Bacon Fall, a preacher's kid from Frankfort, Kentucky. And this happened long before Watergate, uh, long before we had all these problems that we've all so familiar about one of our own Frankfurtonians, the very first to be indicted. 
As we look up and down the, the, the street up here on the corner, notice this big gray building up here. Uh, this building in January of 1970 caught fire, and it was a very devastating fire. We called in the fire departments from Lexington, from Versailles, and it was so cold, it was way below zero, and when they would fire up the water to the building there, instead of it putting the fire out, the water would freeze, and it became like an ice castle, while everything on the inside burned all the way down. Fire was a real hazard, not only in recent times, but in the early pioneer days. The block that we're approaching down here, where we're looking at, that block burned down almost to its entirety two times. In the 1850s, about half of it burned away, and then in the latter part of the 1800s, it burned again. So that's the reason we have a lot of our newer buildings, the 1880s, 1890s, because many of those structures uh, succumbed to fire. We're now approaching Frankfurt's first skyscraper. It is said that the building we know as the McClure Building today, uh, some of the folks you know that never get out of town, that never leave the community, they, uh, when they saw this building were afraid to go inside of it for fear that it might fall down. But this was indeed our very first skyscraper. As we approach uh, the St. Clair Mall where we began our trip, I was telling you about the railroad tracks and how when they first came to town in 1830, they stopped at the Kentucky River because it didn't have a bridge. They built a railroad from Louisville to Frankfort, Kentucky that also stopped at the river where the people would cross either by a footbridge or by a boat. And then in the 1840s, they finally completed them all together. So that consequently, we had the trains running from Lexington to Louisville. It is said that in the western part of the county, we had on Sunday, the preachers, when they would hear the toot, toot, toot of the train, they would stop their sermon and everybody in the congregation would all file out of the church building and go down to the railroad tracks and watch the trains since it was such a, a, a novel thing to see. Well, we're looking at our St. Clair Mall and we can see how beautiful just a little paint will do, red and grays and beautiful trees. And we're also going to take a look at something here, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, many of our towns no longer have in their downtown sections. And we used to have three here at one time in Frankfort, Kentucky. I'm talking about the movie theater. We had uh, the Capitol Theater, and this was the old Grand Theater. And this is all we have left to show you today of our original uh, movie houses. But many of you who remember yesteryear of seeing the old movie theaters can imagine a marquee hanging out there with the flashing lights and uh, Buck Rogers doing this and Gene Autry and Roy Rogers and Randolph Scott and all those other things, and the cereals on Saturday afternoon. Our mall, of course, is beginning to fill up today as we're doing our broadcast with the activities of our bicentennial homecoming. And we've learned a lot of the on our trips from our our viewers and our walkers on the Bicentennial History Walking Tour. And one of the things that was pointed out to me was a tree that was growing out of the side of one of our buildings here on the St. Clair Mall. So that became a feature on our walking tour. We were showing everybody this tree about that thick that was growing about five feet out of the wall of one of our buildings here. Well, when the business folk heard about it, obviously that's going to do damage to the building, they cut the tree down. So the tree was no longer a part of the walking tour. But I'm happy to say that the tree is back. So we'll get a chance to see the, the tree before Old Man Winter comes in and finishes it off. It's located right down here on the St. Clair Mall. In just a few moments, you'll see it. This has not been intended to be a history of Frankfort, Kentucky. And there may have been a few uh, errors along the way. This is generally speaking an opportunity for folks to, uh, to see and meet some of the people that lived here in the capital city. And now you see the tree that is growing out of the building here in Frankfort, Kentucky on the St. Clair Mall. I originally thought that behind that drain pipe perhaps was an open space and that that was just kind of growing up that high. But if you look closely, you'll see behind the drain pipe is brick. So apparently a bird along the way dropped the seed and that seed uh, took fruit. And earlier this summer, it was out about five feet growing and it has grown in the last month to that length because it was just a few leaves about the beginning of uh, September. Well, this is it. This is our efforts here at uh, 
The St. Clair Mall in Frowntown, Frankfort, Kentucky. Our thanks to the Kentucky Bicentennial Commission for affording us a grant to begin this tour. And next year, we hope to continue having walking tours as well here in the capital city. For Russ Hatter and John J. Crittenden and all of our other Frankfortonians, we thank you.